Um, I, I, have, I have a small admission, and that is that this is the first presentation I've actually been to at the gathering. <laughs> the reason is, is that I decided long ago that actually, I, as much as I love the people who present and I have a lot of respect for them and I want to show my appreciation and my support, and I'm, I'm, from what I hear, they've all done an amazing job. I actually prefer to just sit out in the hallways and meet people. Um, it's why I learn languages. It's my raison d'etre. It's exactly the, the biggest motivation for me to, to connect with you, to talk to you, other people who love languages as well, and people who speak the languages I learn and the languages I want to learn. So I apologize to everyone who's presented and maybe thought, where is he? Why isn't he coming? Does he not care? I do care. I just care more for the bits in between, and I have to make a decision. I can't clone myself. And my wife definitely would not want me to clone myself. <laughs> Before I start, now that the room is a lot fuller, I hope you'll indulge me in a selfie so that I can remember this. It's a big thing after two years of being at home. So please indulge me. You ready? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Now let's talk about language. <laughs> OK, so hopefully I won't make a mess of the slideshow, but we'll see how it goes. So my name's Richard. For those of you who don't know me, some of you may already have seen me on places like YouTube or other parts of the interwebs. And I quite like languages. I think they're, they're quite cool. <laughs> um, I, I've been studying them for a long time, since I was about five. I was always fascinated by different accents and different dialects and different ways of using words and pronunciation and to say the same thing that's in your head, sometimes in a slightly different way, but to get a similar message across to somebody who only speaks that particular language or variation of a language. And it's fascinated me for years. And for me, it was the most normal thing ever to imitate and to learn and to take from the people around me and to fit in and to try and belong and to try and learn and understand. And that's also one of the reasons why I enjoy our conversations in between all of these sessions, because I learn a lot from you. Now, the reason we're here today is because of technology. We started a community online from a forum called How to Learn Any Language, and from that there were videos on YouTube, and the ball started rolling and we got together and we had the polyglot conference and the polyglot gathering and then more polyglot conferences, polyglot gatherings, polyglotar. We have a Langfest in Canada. We've had all sorts of events going on around the world to bring us together. And I see this sometimes as a double-edged sword. Sometimes it can divide us and sometimes it can bring us together. And the reason why I've always seen it as a bit of a double-edged sword is because of perception, and because of how we look at each other and how we look at ourselves in turn as a result of this. And I see some nodding heads, so I hope that you can identify with this. How well do I speak a language? Do I speak a language? Do I not speak a language? What's going on? And when I came today, actually, I've had two years of reflection on this, forced reflection. <laughs> Uh, at home, <laughs> uh, uh, there was a little pandemic going around the world. I don't know if you heard of it. And, um, and yeah, so I was stuck in the Balkans for two years, which is very unusual for me, if any of you know how, many, how much I like to travel and meet up with friends and family around the globe. So when I came, I actually didn't want to put anything on my card. And I just ask you, if you want to see if I speak your language, you can speak to me, and you as individuals can all make the decision on your own terms, whether or not I speak your language or languages to your satisfaction. If I do, wonderful. If I don't, it's fine. Maybe I'll learn more someday. That's me. That's my introduction. 
And when people talk to me about languages, and this is very often what happens, especially now during the last two years, I've been at home and I wanted to give back to the community as much as I possibly could. So I've dedicated every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Central European time to doing a live on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram channel. And I take questions from anyone and everyone from all around the world who want to ask in whichever language they want and I can answer in. And I've got a lot of experience from seeing that and doing that over the last two years. Most of the questions, and when I tweeted and put on social media about the topic today, about holistic language learning, I wanted to see what people's interpretation of that actually was. And it was quite interesting because many people wrote and said, well, learning all about the language, all about the language, whether it's speaking, reading, writing, listening, learning a bit about the culture, many people said that to me. And I think that's a fair enough uh, answer. There's not a right answer to this question. It's, uh, it's just a very open-ended question. I don't believe necessarily in complete right and complete wrongs to such questions. I think that there are different opinions and we can agree. We can agree to disagree and we can take on board whatever element we like. So normally when people ask me about languages, it's about how to learn a language. And I, you possibly may have seen if this will click through, that I talk about trees and I talk about all sorts of weird things. I like analogies. This is, this is kind of me. This is the essence of who I am. I like analogies because I think analogies and images stick in our minds. So when I think of a language, I think of a tree, I think of a, a sapling, a seed that we put in the ground when we first start learning that language. And you put water on it, you take care of it, it gets some sunshine, you protect it from the cold. You do all these things on a regular basis to allow that seedling to turn into a sapling to grow into what you then see as a tree. And this tree, as it grows bigger and bigger, you might get some little branches and they would represent some basic chit-chat conversation and some topics or areas that you want to discuss in the language. But as the tree grows, so do those branches develop and they develop into strong branches that then in turn have twigs and leaves. And those leaves represent the words and the different ways that we can use language when we get into the, the, the jargon, the, the slang, into the very minutiae of, of language. And the trees, when they get very solid and very strong, it's a lot more difficult to cut them down. And this becomes an issue sometimes with people in this community where you have some solid trees, but then some little saplings will sprout out of these roots in between, and they could represent languages that, are, languages that are related. You may give them some attention, but if you don't, and if the shade gets too big from the other trees, actually what might happen is they might also start to wither and fade. And we all know that because we've studied languages very often that are related, and then someone comes and says, well, didn't you study Slovak for that challenge in Bratislava? And I say, yeah. They say, well, why don't you speak? It was one of those saplings that came up, and it worked for a while. It enjoyed a bit of the breeze, but then, unfortunately, withered and went away. And I was left with the, the trees that were around it. But trees are nice metaphors, but also islands I like to because when you grow lots of trees, if you think of the trees as a language family, and you grow lots of the trees from the different language families, and you have them as like these anchors on a base, on a solid base, and I always talk about, you then have islands of languages. You can think of these as different language families, if you will. And sometimes they're more closely connected and geographically than others. Sometimes there may be a little sandbank that goes between the islands, but sometimes the bridges that we have for those might be cultural. They might be to do with neighboring countries, shared history, shared communication, trade very often. You'll see these kinds of words come up again and again. Languages that are seemingly unrelated, like Hungarian, where you have Slavic words for the days of the week. It's really interesting to see these, these strange things come in. And often, the local community is not even aware that Četvrtok is related to Četvrtok, or another word in the Slavic language for Thursday, the fourth day, or Shreda, or Shroda, 
which is related to the middle day of the week. So when people ask me about language learning, I give them all of these very normal sort of analogies and talk about all of these things. But is that it? Is that what you all want? You just want the same thing from me, from Luca, from everyone else on how to improve your accent, how to improve your grammar, how to improve your vocabulary. Is that all you need? Is that everything? Is that all we are? Is that what languages represent? Two years of reflection show me that that's not all we are. That's not what we represent. That's not what languages are to us. Language is much more, and we are much more. And so, life kicks in. Do you all learn the same way every single day, every single month, every single year? Or does life kick in? Does something happen that's beyond your control that you cannot do anything about? And this is something, unfortunately, with social media and the divisive nature at times of how that works, we show our best and we show our worst. There's nothing in between, none of the mundane, none of the beige, none of the vanilla. None of that's there, none of it's represented. We see the good and we see the really bad. We don't see the normal, we don't see the... It's, it's, it's so up there and so down there that we sometimes lose sight of actually what the reality is. And so we, our expectations are also skewed. So for me, the whole idea of holistic, when I talk about it in this sense, is about thinking about everything to do with our being, our lives, our souls, why we're doing what we're doing. Sometimes we get ill. We can't stop getting ill. Allow me to tell you a story. It wasn't a serious illness, so I'm not going to sort of traumatize you by this, although it traumatized me slightly. Cast your minds back to about, about four or five weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer, when the organizers of this wonderful event said, learn Ukrainian for the polyglot gathering. You have 50 days to learn Ukrainian. And of course, <laughs> a new sapling starts to appear immediately in my garden on my island. And I'm very happy, Slavic islands flourishing with a new sapling. I start learning Ukrainian, day one. Publicize it on TikTok, publicize it on social media. Learning it day two, aren't you amazing? You're doing so well with Ukrainian. All these wonderful comments coming through. And then some of the sort of voices from the side. Yeah, but you said that wrong. Okay. <laughs> day three, day four. Then I take a drive in Albania. <laughs> and as I drive, and choose the road, the middle road, never choose the middle road. I chose the middle road to go back to the border to go home. Little did I know that the road wasn't completely finished. They had these beautiful roads on the other sides, but the middle road wasn't quite ready. They were still doing, making the tunnels. They were still building everything and making it all very pretty and nice, up to our lovely standards that we want to enjoy when we're driving and we don't have to think about things. Unfortunately, it wasn't that case. I got to a mountain in Albania. It was, it was bigger than this. Okay. I, I'm not very good at showing the size of mountains. With and you'll have to forgive me. But imagine it's very big, okay? It's very, very big, a big mountain. And I start snaking up the mountain in the car, my wife's car. It's a very important point. I'm snaking up the mountain, and I get to a point where I'm driving carefully. Remember, I'm, I'm British, and you can put the Brit in the Balkans, but you can't take the British out of the Brit, so sorry. And the Balkan drivers are getting super frustrated with me because, you know, well, YOLO, so why not drive 70,000 miles an hour down the road on a sneaky round mountain road in Albania because, hey, that's fun. And, oh, and seeing that it looks basically like I'm on a plane, it's that high. I mean, it's really, really high. Just to give you an idea of what this was. 
And then I decide, okay, I'm not going to get stressed or panicked because of the crazy drivers behind me. So I pull over where it's safe, allow them to pass. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get out the car. I'm going to enjoy a bit of fresh air. I'm going to stretch my legs. I've been on a mountain doing this with my foot for the past hour, and my foot's starting to hurt. So I open the car door, I get out, I start walking ahead of the car. Then I hear a beep. Then I look back. My wife's car starts rolling down the mountain. <laughs> okay. It's bad, right? <laughs> you know that. You know as well as I do. Going home wasn't an option if the car didn't come back with me. <laughs> I was jumping after the car. Okay. So, what did I do? Fortunately, I'm British, so I rolled the window down while I was driving. Very on Balkan, I could be put in prison for saying that out loud. They have to have all the windows closed in case they catch a cold from the draft. But I drive with the window open because I'm, I'm a psycho. Uh, that's just the way I roll. So anyway, I had the window open. I couldn't open the car door. So what did I do? I dived through the window like Spider-Man. Spider-Man I ain't, okay? Let's just put that out there. I mean, I know I look the part, but I'm not, really, I'm not. I grab the handbrake, the car stops, we're safe. I don't have to jump off the mountain after all, it's good. I breathe out and then realize that it hurts a little bit when I breathe. Bearing in mind, I've just dived on top of a metal open window to grab a handbrake. And I was fine, but it did hurt just when I breathed. So I had to try to stop breathing so much. <laughs> okay. Fast forward back to me being ill now and taking on the Ukrainian challenge. Well, as you can imagine, this slowed me down somewhat. When we're sick, when something like that happens that's out of our control, the expectation often, and sometimes the peer pressure, when we've put something out on social media is, how are you getting on with Ukrainian? How did you do with your Ukrainian? I saw that you're learning Ukrainian, isn't that amazing? And I have to then go, yeah, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. And I appreciate the questions. I think it's very nice because you're showing concern. The thing is, is that sometimes, for many, many of us, that kind of question can make us feel that we put pressure on ourselves because we feel we have to perform. We've put something out there on social media. We have something to live up to. And that's when I realized that actually people come to me quite often and say, I'm just in a really bad place at the moment because some injuries are not physical. Some injuries are here. We have to look after ourselves because we're not learning any languages while we're sick. Well, we're not on form. We're not doing very much, and we can't expect to do active learning, for sure. Not in the same way as when we're 100%, or even 80%. And the only thing we can do is actually worse, worsen our condition if we do that, because it puts extra stress on our bodies. We have to look after ourselves. So I decided I'm just going to leave it. I'm not going to make some grand announcement that I stopped learning Ukrainian. I'm just going to leave it and let people ask. And I knew I was coming here, so I thought I could share the story with you today, and I hope you enjoyed my terrible story of almost jumping off a mountain in, Mas in, in, um, in Albania. So there we go. But we've got, to, we've got to do that. We've got to look after ourselves. But it's not just illness. When we're looking from the outside, from inside, our perceptions are very often skewed. Because I might watch Luca doing amazing things with Hungarian and Greek and think, oh, I'm not doing that. What should I do? I should, I should go and study as well. Because otherwise, he's going to be better than me, and I'm not going to be as good as him. And, and you get into this whole crazy thing of competing against people. Stop, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> it's just like, seriously, in my lifetime, I always say, no one's ever come and given me an orange for learning languages or any prize. I did say that once in Australia, and Benny, if you're here, he came and gave me an orange at the, end of the, of <laughs> the end of the event. So I now cannot say that. Thank you very much, Benny. Um, 
But I, I, you, you don't. The thing that you do this for is for yourself, for your own well-being. We can buy hundreds of books. We can put stress on ourselves. But the only thing that happens is when we internalize things and we make them our own, we make them part of us, and that's when it's real. So actually, looking out is fine to check on others, to see what people are doing, to get inspiration, to get motivation. But we've got to, as I say in Spain, ojo. We've got to be careful that we don't go so far that it's actually detrimental to our own well-being. We've got to look after ourselves. Sometimes we just do get sad. We need to take a moment. Sometimes when people have said to me they can't learn a language or they're finding it hard, my advice has been, I want you to agree with yourself that you will take at least a week, if not two, if not a month off learning a language learning the language you're on. Don't do anything. At the most, if you have to, you can listen to something passively, at the very most. But don't do anything. Give yourself permission. It's important that you give yourself permission. You need to own it. Because when you don't own it, that's when all the negative voices come in. That's when you start saying to yourself, I'm failing, I'm not doing it, I'm not getting there. But when you give yourself permission and you agree with yourself in a very conscious way, that's when you own the situation. And that's when you can move forward in a positive way with your learning, with your life. Because you need to be there with your mind and with your body. You need to be there to take it in, to really internalize the language that you're seeing and studying. So I've told people in the past, take time off, go for walks. Walks are great. Rides, if you like bikes, go to the gym, whatever you, whatever you like, whatever, whatever you do that you enjoy, do you. You don't need to emulate me or anyone else. Do you. Do what works for you. If it's petting your cat, pet your cat. Anyone who knows me, I quite like cats now. Sometimes we're tired as well. This though, tired, can be a thing where we say, let's do it before we do something else. There can be more practical steps to take if we're tired. We don't necessarily have to take two weeks off just because we're tired. But what we can do is say, okay, well, I've got a lot on at the moment, so maybe we minimize what we're doing, maybe we do something else, maybe we use different activities, maybe we are more in the passive side of things. But it's achievable. We can do things sometimes even when we're tired but we've got to take care that we're not too tired, that we just burn out. Maybe it's listening to something before we go to sleep, if that works for you. Try it. Life and language learning and all of these techniques that people talk about with language learning, they're things that you should try. But no one can write a book that's tailor-made to each and every single one of you in this room. No one. No one can do it. Because you're all different. I know we like to have our groups in society that we say, I belong to this group, I'm part of this, I belong to this group, I'm part of that, and that's great. But when it comes down to it, the future is actually individuals. Because you could appear to be from a group and you could be perceived as one thing, but you could be completely different inside. And your mindset can be different. So following someone else just because you naturally identify with them because of the same color, the same shape, the same religion, the same whatever, doesn't necessarily fit. Sometimes we need to listen to everyone to take bits of what everyone has. This is why I love hearing lots of different people. Let's not get tied up. Let's not get sort of, you know, really down and into just everything that everyone else is doing and obsessed with it. Let's get liberated from this kind of looking at what everyone's doing around us and being sucked in to these black holes of nothingness that just take us nowhere. And we can stop reflecting in this way. Because what we do when we reflect on social media particularly and in our language learning and our journey is we'll reflect back what we think people want to see. So all they see then is themselves back and they perpetuate the same cycle that goes round and round and round and round and round and the sky is only blue and it's only got a couple of clouds. 
But that's not what it is. That's not what the sky is. That's not what the world is. That's not who we are. It's not what language learning is. It's actually a rainbow. Because it's made up of many colors. It's made up of many droplets. It's made up of many things. It's more than just one thing. It's more than, and it changes as well. The rainbow sometimes fades. Sometimes it's stronger. Sometimes it's a double rainbow. But we need the rainbow. We need the rainbow in our life. It's a positive thing. And when we come together, particularly in a very difficult time like we've all just been through with the pandemic, it's amazing the strengths you can get from different individuals within that rainbow. So look for your droplets in the rain. Look at the colors. Look at the people around you that are from different backgrounds, different beliefs, different genders, different whatever. Because you as an individual are what counts. More than the whole of anything, as an individual, we need to take on board. And that's why a diverse set of voices is really important. And those diverse voices can come from places we could never imagine. And this is one of the other reasons why I really appreciate your diverse voices when I'm walking around this area talking to you as individuals. Some comments I might not like, sometimes comments I might love, but all the comments build me as well. They feed me too. I can evaluate what works for me and what doesn't work for me, what's true for me, what isn't true for me. I can evaluate that, I own that, that's me. That's who I am as a learner and as a person. And that's the thing that no one can give you in a course or a book, but it's what you can get out of those courses and books that counts. So I just like this picture. There's no actual real reason why I've included this picture, just because in Germany they call, they call us Brits island apes. And I embrace that term, and I see myself as an island ape, and I love it. And in fact, it's a hashtag I use on Facebook for some of my very silly quotes that I put on or things that I take pictures of. So that's why I have that there. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you all so much for listening to me. Just to say, you're welcome to ask questions. I also want to reiterate, oh, what happened there? Oh, dearie me. Just ignore, ignore the blue screen of death. Um, you're welcome to ask questions. You're also welcome, oh, oh, there. Oh, wow, okay. I didn't see that. That's amazing. Okay, you're also welcome at the end to come up to me and talk to me. If you haven't talked to me at all during the conference, please do. I would particularly like a photo because I like to take photos with people so that I remember. I like the memories that come back year on year so that I remember where I was, who was here. I just really, really love that. So please do come up to me. Okay, may I ask what you eat and drink to become such a genius in languages? <laughs> okay. You're not gonna like the answer to this. <laughs> or maybe you will, a lot of chocolate. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No. Um, I don't. <laughs> you mentioned illness and how are, some of, or how some are more mental. Do you have any advice for coming back after a long pause from something like a bereavement? Very, very good question. Very good question indeed. And I've been through this myself through bereavement, and it's important when we have a clear moment in that, in that state of shock, in that state of sadness, in that state of reflection after someone dies, when we have those moments of clarity, which often we do, in amongst it, and we sometimes feel guilty for having them, make a promise with yourself and just say to yourself, actually, I recognize where I am, this is a moment that I'm having. This isn't going to be my new normal. I'm going to possibly go back to the sadness. And you can, you can do that and talk to somebody who's professionally trained. I'm not 
professionally trained in this. But do make a promise to yourself that you're not going to put pressure on yourself in addition to what you're going through. Languages are a positive thing that we do in life. They're positive. They shouldn't be a stress. They shouldn't be a burden. They shouldn't be something that we, we add to our already heavy load when we've, we're going through something very difficult. So at least make the promise to yourself to take time and recognize that you are going through something. Wow. Um, what's your daily routine in language learning? Um, well, how long have we got? Do we have an extra session for this? Um, actually, my, my daily routine is probably quite boring. Um, I made my life multilingual, is the very short answer. So when I started learning more and more languages, I made uh, my life very multilingual. I live in the Balkans. I speak five languages at home. I work with and in and through different languages. I travel to the neighboring countries as well. And I now learn languages to, for what I need them for. So I will do language projects nowadays. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I use probably around, I don't know, I mean, at home we use English, French, Macedonian, Spanish, and German. And then outside the house we use Albanian, Turkish, and very often Serbian because we get a lot of Serbian TV. And we send jokes very often to each other in Serbian or Croatian or Bosnian. And um, actually Montenegrin I got one in the other day. So, yeah, in all of those languages, the Balkan languages, and on Bulgarian, we used to send jokes in Bulgarian too. Um, and then I'll go to places like Greece, but I'll go on holiday. So I don't need to speak amazing Greek, but to get by, it's fine. And it's recognizing what I need them for and what I can use them for. Because it's all well and good studying a gazillion languages and taking them all to C2 level, as every, everyone wants, right? What we, but the reality is very different because do you have a gazillion hours in your day to maintain the level of language that you need to keep them all at that level? Probably not. I don't. I need to sleep and go to the toilet sometimes and eat and God knows what else. So, I mean, I, I don't have that time. I don't know if you do. If anyone does, please let me know what your secret is because I'd be amazed. Um, what are your other hobbies besides languages? Who said that? <laughs> Out of the room right now. There are no other hobbies. <laughs> Terrible. How dare you? Heresy, I say. Heresy. My word. What a rude question. How do you cope with maintaining so many languages on a high level? I don't. I just do it. I just talk. If I forget a word, it's not the end of the world. If I make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. If I say something stupid, it's often funny and I laugh more than the other person. And then I embarrass myself and them more because I'm like laughing like an idiot. But that's just me. I mean, I just carry on with it and do what I can. Um, how often do you... Oh, oh, sorry. What is the native tongue of your pentalingual... <laughs> Pentalingual, oh my word. I don't think I've ever seen that written before. My pentalingual daughter. What's her native tongue? Oh, I, I don't even know how to answer that because my, I guess, I mean, what do we mean by native, right? I mean, so her mother language is Macedonian, and for me, as a baby, she learned French and English from day one, and then German and Spanish from about 18 months. 16 months, 16 months old she was. And it's difficult to say. She, she's very strong in English, obviously, and, and Macedonian. She studies in English now. And she's very strong in Macedonian because we, we live in Skopje where people speak that language. And, um, and the other languages uh, she uses, but less so. Obviously, we don't live in France, we don't live in Germany, we don't live in Spain. So the contact with those languages, and she's got to study her other subjects. She likes mathematics and, and uh, IT, and that's what she likes. I just gave her languages, because if I give her money, she'll only spend it on rubbish. So I can give her languages, and she can decide what she does with it, but the, the linguistic knowledge sits somewhere in her head, right? And German and Spanish particularly are good for English speakers, because they help us with English literature later on, and uh, understand how English grammar works. So I find them very, very useful tools, and for me, they were extremely useful when I was using English professionally. So. That's kind of where we are. I, I know it's not really an answer to your question, but I hope you'll forgive me. Um, how do you stay connected to other polyglots like Luca and Benny, and does it help to motivate yourself? Well, Luca's, Luca's beautiful. I mean, how can you not stare at photos of Luca all day on the internet? I mean, I mean seriously. Uh, I mean, he's like a mythical being. If he were an animal, he'd be a unicorn. What can I say? Um, 
and, and Benny, Benny is a really beautiful, lovely, big, huggy bear. And so I, I like them both. And yes, they, I do find motivation from them. I see their journeys, and I see what they're doing. And every now and again, we do connect. It's, it's got a bit crazier in over the last, say, 10 years, because they've grown audiences. They've, they've gone down slightly different roads than me in terms of they've made it their business right to do all of this stuff. So our opportunities for communication on a daily basis have, have, have dwindled, but that doesn't mean that the con connections that we make when we meet up aren't equally as rewarding for me and enriching. And yet I find motivation not just in them, but actually in many people in this audience. So, um, uh, in fact, Raphael, I don't know if Raphael's here, but he, he's, he's from Poland and he's on TikTok, and I absolutely adore his videos. And when I went up to him, he was really surprised, and I said, I, I just love what you do. I, I just love seeing you and hearing your voice, and he's a great guy. I'll, I'll try and share it in the group so you can follow him, but he's great. Um, what's the official number of languages which you can speak at C1? C oh my, word, really? I, they didn't exist. I mean, this is the problem, right? I, 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 I know it kind of sounds like I'm trying to avoid the question, and I kind of am. I kind of am. The reason I'm avoiding the question is I've never sat a C2 exam. It, it w just wasn't a thing when I was growing up. And when I was at university, we didn't have a C1 or C2 exam in any language. It just wasn't, wasn't there. I've, I've done an A1, an A2, and a B1 exam. And I did those in Turkish. And all I can say is many of my languages are higher than that level that I achieved in Turkish. So I know that they're higher than that. And I know that... I, I went to the Czech Republic and I did um, a course that is now graded at C1 for Czech, but I would not say that my Czech is C1 currently, absolutely not. When I went back to Czech Republic, about maybe five, five or seven, no, maybe, seven, maybe even longer now, all the, all the years are skewed in my head after COVID, so maybe it was seven years ago, I, I sat in on a, on a B2 course again and finished that. So, but I, I really don't know, it's very difficult to say. Um, that's why I leave this blank and say you decide, honestly. Um, have you ever had any feelings of pressure to succeed in all your language projects? If yes, how did you overcome it? Um, no. <laughs> I, ha I, I actually haven't. I don't put myself under the stress. Um, I, I just put my hand up and say no, I, that didn't happen. Like I did now with Ukrainian, it didn't happen. Um, like I did Slovak, and I got to a point where I competed in the assessment and was judged by a panel to be very good after a few weeks of study. Um, it went back to like almost zero. I mean, I know a few basic words in Slovak now. That's pretty much it. Does it bother me? Not really. Um, it's normal. And I think we need to normalize and make that a natural thing that we see that we don't just do this once. Sometimes it's an ongoing process. Sometimes there are, there are dips in our learning. There are dips in our knowledge. There are times when we're at peaks and we're doing really well. And this is a moving thing. It's, um, it's a living thing. Language is living. And if we're not speaking it or using it, how do we retain it to the same level? Um, who inspires you? Do you have any heroes or role models? Uh, can be in or outside of language learning. Uh, okay, here, yeah, I know, okay, right. Well, I, I do have a lot of people I really look up to. Heroes and role models, it's very difficult. They're, they're, they're quite charged words. I mean, just at this event right now, I mean, I, I, I marvel at Judith Meyer. I just don't know how she does everything she does, and I tell her that constantly. She must be sick of me by now. Um, and yeah, I mean, do, do I have other, I just have people moments of, you know, when I follow people, I'm like really inspired by what people do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll meet somebody who's, who's um, you know, people overcome so many things in life and then you meet them and you talk to them and you get these moments of inspiration constantly. And I, I don't want to name everyone, I just named you because I just, I mean, Judith, Judith. I mean, she started the Polyglot Gathering in, in Berlin, so I think she deserves a mention for that reason alone. Um, so, yeah, there are lots and lots of people, too many to mention. What do you think about SRS-based repetition system? Uh, like Anki, uh, quite interesting using... Okay, for learning vocabulary, 
yeah, there are lots of people that love it. I am um, yes and no. Uh, sometimes I go through spates of using it, and sometimes I feel it's working, but sometimes what I find is I, re I remember the predictability of the word set. So the memory is a weird thing, right? The memory is very weird. Sometimes we have, we remember the words that were included in the set, but we then don't necessarily know how to take those out of the set and use them in real life. So you may have experienced, please nod your heads if you agree with this, you may have experienced in time, sometimes that you'll use Anki or something else, you'll learn all these words, you'll do really, really well on Anki, and then you'll go and you'll forget the word that you can't remember it. Please nod if you, if this, yeah, or put your hands up, fantastic. So, thank you, I'm not alone, great, thank you. Um, and, and, and I think that's to do with, we need some sort of trigger to trigger the memory, and sometimes when it's an Anki set or something, it's actually that that triggers the memory instead of the actual internali internalizing the actual word or the sentence. And so this is why I'm kind of on the fence. I, I, see, the, I see a usefulness in it, but at the same time, I also see how it can be problematic sometimes. But if it works for you and you enjoy it, go for it. <laughs> How many days do you think it will take to develop a rhythm for studying a language every day to make it a habit? Hi from Brazil, watching online. Hello, hello from Brazil, watching online. Thank you very much. All that to the bay. So um, that's a complicated one. Um, so after during this pandemic, I started uh, actually coaching people with language learning. Uh, issues. It started very, very innocently, actually. A friend of the family asked if I could help with their son uh, to get him through his final exams in German at university. And we'd work through texts, and we'd, we'd look at how the German sentence structure and German words and etymology would work um, in German, and how that would then be translated into Macedonian. And we'd, 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 we'd show, see the comparisons and things like that. So we worked on very structured things, because it was for his exams. And then he wanted to be able to speak it so that he could use it for his exams, as well, for use the language for work. And so afterwards, fortunately, he also got a job. So it was quite good for me. I, was, I felt very proud. It's a proud dad moment, you know. Even though he's not my son, I felt very, very proud of him. And he really got into a rhythm very quickly because he was highly motivated and he had a very specific goal in mind. Sometimes when we have a goal in mind, some people like goals, some people don't. Sometimes a, a, a long-term goal can be cool because we can then start separating off into, into sizable bites that we can just go for. And he did that and he started listening to things in the morning, reading things, uh, practicing the language. He'd go to groups online to practice. He'd use uh, he was using a Zoom group sometimes, but the, you could go on Clubhouse or on another app and, and, and practice the language. You don't need to necessarily go anywhere else. You could get an italki teacher and practice. You can do whatever you want, but the, the key thing is that you do something, you do something often. To actually keep it as a habit depends on you. Bear in mind that you can start something and do it for a month and say, yeah, I've got the habit, I've got the habit, I've got the habit. Then one of those problems occurs, right? Illness. Depression. Someone might die, something bad might happen in life, and all of a sudden, you've gone from this, yeah, I've got it, I've got it. What happens then? Have you failed? Is it fair to say you failed? Would you tell somebody else? If you were to look at someone else who did that, would you say to them, ah, you're a failure? Who, who would say that to somebody? Anyone? No, of course we wouldn't. Who would say it to themselves? Honestly, tell me honestly. Hands up. If I don't see every hand, I'm amazed. Because um, many of us will have that voice. The biggest hater is in our heads. So what we need to remember when we're talking about getting a pattern is what is that pattern over the longer period of time, three months, a year? How do we then adapt to that pattern for when we are in our low points or we're sick or something else is going on, we're busy at work, some a really important project on, right? We've got to adapt, and we've got to understand that life is like this. It's not like that. How am I doing for time? Can I get more questions? Um, why are the most popular people polyglot men? Are they? Are they? Are, are they still? Because I, 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 would, I would have hoped that that had changed. With people like Lindy, Judith, Lydia, 
Are these not people, no, that we can, we can look up to? <laughs> as far as I know, they don't identify as male. I, I think there are a lot of, um, Christine, are, are there not a lot of these people out there now that are, are not just men? I, I mean, I, I appreciate it was an issue in the beginning, but men are like that often. Men are a lot more prepared to go out there and just go, look what I can do, aren't I amazing? And there's a, lot, there's a lot of things going on for why that happens, right? There's a lot going on, and it's, you can unpack that for yourselves. I'm not gonna spoon feed you my reasons for why I think that happens, but I think that we've got past the point now where we do have, and I am inspired by people of different genders around the world who inspire me from different places, different cultures, different countries. So, I don't know if that's true. Just a short info about the time. Yeah, uh, so, since well, there is only lunch after this talk, I wouldn't uh, stop this, but I already closed the questions, but you still can vote on them. And I leave it just up to you how many of them you want to answer. Okay. But you feel free to leave if you're, if you're absolutely uncomfortable. Uh, I'll stay for as long as you want me to stay. Okay? I do this on my lives. I often I do it for an hour and I stay for like an hour and a half. So if, if you can put up with me, feel free. But if you, if you need to go, I completely understand. We do need to pee and we do need to eat. So that's fine. Um, also, I might be boring as hell, I don't know. I mean, okay. I've heard you speak of overlearning and its necessity in language learning. Could you please describe your understanding of this concept and its benefits? Really good question. I love that question. And not that I didn't like the others, but I really like this question. Because, yes, language, I see languages as a very different topic to almost anything else that we learn in life. Okay, hear me out on this. Any doctors in the room? Okay, good. Any lawyers in the room? Okay. Out of the lawyers and the doctors, do you remember everything from your first degree in law and your first medical degree? No, you don't. And why don't you? Because it's not relevant and you specialized, right? You specialized in that. You might understand some concepts from that because you had to get the, the, the logic behind it. But you now know where to go to to look that thing up or to recommend someone to go to somewhere else. Languages are different. And they're different because you can't learn the present tense in Spanish and then get to talking about politics and forget the present tense. You have to take the basics with you. That means you have to internalize the language. And that's the big difference between languages very often and other things. We do get rusty in some topics, but it's almost the opposite of your professions. Because we lose sometimes the, the special areas. We always have to retain the base, and we have to really manage it well to retain that degree of fluency. Does that make sense to you? Does that? OK, good. Uh, imagine if they said no. <laughs> I'd look like a right idiot, wouldn't I? <laughs> OK. What do you think about using efficient but boring tactics to learn a language? The fact that you've used the word boring in there I think you can, okay, I want to hear, is boring good in language learning? No, no. If you're bored, you need to change it up. You need to make it interesting for you. This is where the individuality comes, okay? Everything can be made different. It can be tailored to your needs. It can be tailored to what suits your personality, what suits your motivation, what suits things that make it interesting for you. As soon as you describe something as boring, it's a matter of time before you just leave it to one side. Wish I were there. Great talk. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, it's been a long time since Fukuoka. It has indeed. Too long. Uh, your un unusual Japanese friend. Thank you, my unusual Japanese friend. Thank you. Where are you, my unusual Japanese friend? Thank you very much. Online, anonymous. Anonymous? At least put your name. Okay. Was some of the motivation of you doing this talk due to what you've seen and heard in, in these past two pandemic years among the languages? Absolutely. Everything, everything is to do with this. Because this is something that's really come out online and it's really not, not in what I see online with the, the, the public conversations, but with the private conversations, with the groups. I, I run these um, language learning therapy groups and I, I love doing them. I love it. It's like my favorite thing because 
we talk in very honest terms in groups about what we're going through. With language learning, we suggest things to try, we come back, we share etymolo etymology stories, sometimes, and sometimes we share just things are just difficult. Actually, I don't want to talk about that, I want to talk about what's going on and how I can maybe navigate around it, what I need to do. Sometimes they just come to listen to the others as well and how they talk about languages because that's what keeps their sort of their fire, the flicker, you know, going and burning within them to go back to languages at some point when they can. For people who haven't learned integrated languages, or haven't integrated languages into their lives, how many languages do you think is too many to learn at once? How long's a piece of string is the is a sort of unfortunately. Um, there's not one answer to that. I hate to, I, I, I mean, I, I question dodge when it's really necessary. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to say because it could be very specific to every individual on this planet. Depends on your community, which languages you hear, depends on the type of media you, you take in. One thing I can say is this. You can learn different languages at the same time. It's possible. I, I did it and I'm still here. Um, what I say is, if you find it confusing after a few months, leave one language to one side, focus on the other one. The other language isn't going anywhere. It's going to be there when you come back. It's not a race. It's not a competition. You're doing it for you. You're doing it for positive reasons. Go back to it later. If you feel you can, remember also, the more languages you're learning at one time, the more languages you need to maintain, the more, time, the more your time is divided. Because you can't clone yourself to have a German-speaking version of yourself, a Spanish-speaking version of yourself, a Chinese-speaking version of yourself, and then at night you magically come back and become one person again. It's not how it works. And I presume some of you work, yeah, or study. Do, do any of you, do, do you all sleep as well? Or is that just me? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, do you, do you eat? Yeah, that's well, hopefully after this. I might, I might keep you and I make you starve now after this. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you too long. Yeah, we'll be eating. If you don't get off that stage, we won't be eating. Yeah, I can, I can, I can feel it now. Um, what's the method you use to study vocabulary? Very good question. Depends on the vocabulary. It really depends on the vocabulary. Mostly through context and repetition. Forgetting things many, 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 many times and realizing what's important to me, for me to remember and what's useful within the community I'm using the language with. Because if I don't use the vocabulary they use, and I focus on vocabulary that's completely random, well, I'm not going to get the, the repetition I need to internalize that vocabulary and that language. Because if I don't get that, then I'm basically lost. I mean, I've got nothing going for me with the language. And you're not likely to remember it and to be able to use it later. But when you want to very, learn very specific things, say names of birds, names of flowers, names of trees, names of weird fruits and vegetables that you like. You may not get that in the wild ever. So sometimes you may need to learn it, use a memory palace, use um, mononic system so that you make a story out of the different words so that you can remember them and make them a lot come alive for you. So sometimes it's a case of taking a word and splitting it up into sections so that you can make associations with the different parts. And then you can start to put it together later, and it sticks. And I did this once years and years ago with a very odd word, uh, with Armenian. I was learning Armenian for some reason, because I just like languages, as I said at the start. And the word was pineapple. And does anybody know the word for pineapple in Armenian? So, OK, I'm going to spoil the surprise and tell you. So the word for pineapple in Armenian is arkeachenzor. Now, it's one of the only words that I now remember in Armenian. All the rest is gone, apart from like, hello, how are you? And it was the word that I could not remember. And now I remember it because I made such a thing about it in my head that it's stuck. And I use it in these kinds of situations to, to give an example. So I now end up repeating it constantly. And so we have to keep repeating things to make them stick. But now I'm left with no Armenian except for Arkeachenzor, which when I said to an Armenian to impress them, they said, actually, we tend to say Ananas. <laughs> Make your vocabulary relevant. 
That's the lesson. But an interesting story about the etymology of Arkea Khanzor is the, that word literally means, Khanzor is the word for an apple. And Arka is the word for a king. So it's the king of the apples. It's got a crown on it. I think that's quite cool. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, it's pretty, isn't it? OK. Does the ability to learn languages and memorize new words really get worse with age? Or can we train these abilities and they'll stay with us all life long? Can I get back to you on that when I'm about 80? <laughs> um, I mean, I've seen people who learn languages later in life, and they do so very well. Uh, there was a, a, a lady from the United Kingdom who learned Russian, I think, in her 60s or 70s, then did a degree in Russian, master's, and then did a doctorate in the language, went to Russia, started translating text from Russian to English. So that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I think she's not, she's not bad at Russian. Let's, let's put it that way. So and she was, she was yeah, yeah, a little bit older, right? Um, how long does it stay? Who knows? Again, how long is a piece of string? Um, how do you approach learning a second or third language from a fa Oh, from a f did that go down? Where did I go? Oh. Third one. Am I, am I going? OK. How do you approach learning? Oh, am I, have I missed one? OK. Um, were you from the start more interested in deepening your language, your, your learn? You're, you're, you're trolling me now. I swear. There's a troll in the I'm, room. Is it, is it one of you wants to go for lunch and you're trying to stop me? Is this what you're trying to do to me now? I'm going to make you read them out, so be careful. I've got my, I've got my eye on you. Oh, right? I've got my eye on you. I can see what you're doing on the side. So I'm just explaining the languages, the questions jump with the voting, but I now fix the, the upmost ones. Is that this? what you're doing this? You're all to blame, you awful people. Okay. Please read the blue one. I okay. always the blue one. one. The, the, blue, bl the blue, blue one or the blue, blue one? The, the, the only blue one. <laughs> this is where we need another blue, right? Blue, the blue one. How do you approach learning a second or third language from a family where you already speak one, say, ooh, hello, uh, say Slavic? Um, <laughs> very cautiously. Uh, <laughs> So I made a promise with myself when I started learning Slavic languages that I wouldn't learn certain Slavic languages just because it messed with my melon. Um, it really did. My, my brain was like just goo. You start learning, when I started learning Slovak, and it was fine for, for Bratislava for the challenge. It was fine to use in the city, but it turned very quickly back into Polish and Czech. And in fact, just before, I've been focusing so much on trying to speak Polish again while I've been here that I tried to speak to a, a Czech person and it was just, I was fighting the Slovak, the, sorry, the, the Slovak, the, the Polish words in my head because it's so difficult and you're, you're going so slowly and you almost feel like you're walking through treacle sometimes. So slowly, cautiously, and forgive yourself when, even if it's a language that you study to a high level, it's fine if you haven't spoken it for a while and you start mixing up with a language you speak less well or have had less experience of. That happens to me all the time. Um, does the ability to learn, OK, I'm, I am right now. Does the ability to learn languages and memorize new words really get worse? No, we've done that. We're, right? Yeah. Am I going mad on stage? No. Are you all going mad with me? Good, 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 good. I'm glad. We, I think we can get a discount on our, um, on our, on our yeah, on the hospital when we go for our, get our bills from the psychiatrist. Um, OK. Were you from the start more interested in deepening your, la your learning, or have you been interested since the beginning broadening through different language families? This is a really good question as well. Not that the rest weren't, but it's a good question. Because often I see online people saying, ah, you know, they're not real polyglots because they're learning lots of different languages and they're not really deepening their knowledge. Actually, I don't think this is a mutually exclusive thing. Um, sometimes you'll learn a language like, I'll take my case with Spanish. I studied Spanish at university. And honestly, I got to the end of my degree, and I'd never, no, I, I didn't get to the end of my degree. I got to maybe a couple of years into my degree. And it was Portuguese that introduced me to the word morar in Spanish as a verb. I didn't know that in Spanish, but it's a very normal word in Portuguese. Well, not so much in, in Brazil. I'm looking at my Brazilian friends there. But, it, but in, in, in the Portuguese that I learned at university, which was Portuguese de Portugal, it was uh, morar, it was, was very 
common for I live, right? But in Spanish, it has this idea of to dwell. It's used in poetry. It's used in a more flowery way. And so, yes, absolutely, learning different language families can really enrich your, your understanding of other languages you speak. And it can sometimes also mess with your melon, as I said, but it, I find it generally quite fun to do. I learned lots of English words, actually, through other languages. So I didn't know the words. I, I learned the words in, in, in Turkish. Huri gibi bir insan, which means um, like an angelic type looking person, very beautiful person. And they, huri, actually, I couldn't find the word in English, but then I looked in the dictionary, it was huria, which meant nothing to me. Any English speakers know the word huria in English? No. Any Arabic speakers recognize it? It's taken from. Huria. Huria. So it, it's kind of like a very, a, very, a very pretty person, apparently at the gates of heaven or something. Um, and anyway, it's an English word as well that I had no idea about. So sometimes I get enriched with these kinds of little nuggets of information. You learn Greek and you learn all of the why words are said in a certain way, what words mean. Amethyst, does anybody know the reason why we say amethyst? No? Okay, yes. So it's to do with methos, which is drunk in Greek. And methos is like, literally, you're not drunk. The a is the opposite, right? So the reason why we say amethyst is that in the churches in, in Greece, they used to use goblets or even just wear rings made of amethyst because they had to drink the rest of the communion wine that was left over. And they said that if they drank it from amethyst, amethos, <laughs> they, that they would not get drunk. So there we go. And I love these little things. This is basically, this is what drives my engine all day. I mean, I've got thousands of these that I love. So yes, learning lots of languages helps you to deepen your awareness and knowledge of other ones. Um, ang, actually, I've seen Gareth, Angen in Welsh. Angen in Welsh is? Need. Angeni in Greek. It's a Greek word in Welsh. It's the same word. I never knew. Who knew, right? Welsh and Greek. And it bypassed English. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Just, uh, excuse me. I think like we are a bit now uh, late in the time. I would say we you answer two more questions because we have still eight okay. to go and we'll be a bit much. Yes. So how about we just pick two questions and then... Yeah, uh, pick two questions. Pick them for me because if I look, it will probably go haywire. I simply go by the votes, I think. There was one just upvoted, so... Okay. Which one? Do Top. you feel... Do you feel often like you're competing with the other polyglots who offer language courses? No. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't feel. Then how about the next? Do you ever go through entire days without speaking or thinking in your language of birth? I don't think in any language. So every day, yes. So my, my thoughts are not in a language. My thoughts are just in feelings and in visual. In fact, I would challenge most people to say that really you, you, you actually delude yourself in thinking that you think in a language. I know it's controversial. I know it's controversial, I know, but I'm going there. Um, the reason is, is that I can't think, I can't speak and use language quickly enough to keep up with my thoughts. This is why we often go, blah, 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 and you can't think of the word, right? Or if you say something, a feeling that you have, imagine a time when you've had a feeling, and you say a word and you go, oh, it's not quite that, because you can't describe it. And so I don't think we do. I think that we, we think very quickly afterwards with the words. They come very quickly afterwards. But I do think we don't necessarily think in vocabulary as we imagine we do. It's not a monologue in, in, our, in our heads, is it? Some of you do. Some of you might do on purpose, but it, I think that when you have an instant reaction or an instant feeling or you see something, the word comes after. Thank you. I think uh, we can wrap it up. And okay. Thank you. Yes. Can, can I just say congratulations to all of you who survived to the end of the, this talk. The certificates will be out front so you can pick them up. You've all graduated C2 Richard Simcott. <laughs> <laughs>